Have you ever wondered what sets apart those legendary guitarists from the millions of other guitar players? Have you ever wondered what got them to the heights of the highest highs or gave them such long and successful careers? Well, today I'm gonna share five tips that can help you move in that direction and maybe improve your playing along the way. Let's have a think about that. Welcome to the 145 World Podcast, where we are here to strengthen music careers and communities one song at a time. And now, here's your host, Jacob Wing. Yeah! Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. Today, we've got a really fun one. I get to talk about five of my personal favorite legendary guitarists and how what they do can apply to everything in your music career, your playing, what you do on a daily basis to become a better musician and launch your music career even further forward. Uh, Just want to take a second to thank everybody for this, giving us all these views, all these likes. If you haven't yet, give us a subscribe. Just take a second. It makes such a huge difference. Thank you. It's really pushing everything forward. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for that. And as we move into this, I, we're going to be talking about all these great tips, at least five great tips, but I just want to touch on a couple things first and foremost. And the number one thing before we get into this is that, yes, we're talking about five legendary guitarists, but if you're not a guitarist and that's not your area of expertise, this applies to everything. You could take all of these and apply them to being a singer or a piano player or a bass player. It doesn't matter what you do and what your area of interest is and what your focus is. This can apply to you and what you do as well. So just remember that as we go forward, it just happens to be this is what I know and it it comes from a place of how this can help people going forward with their career, but it can apply to everybody, including yourself. Uh, The other thing I wanna touch upon, of course, is that even though we just picked out five things here that we think are very helpful and we gave examples of five very famous and legendary people, each one of these people that we're citing could fall underneath all five of these tips And the real big thing to take away from that is that not that all these people are that amazing. It's just that there is a theme when it comes to reaching the top heights of whatever profession you're a part of, whatever skill it may be. If you're the best at that, you're usually covering a lot of bases. You're usually doing a lot of things to get to that. So all five of these tips, even though we singled out individuals for each one of these, every one of them can apply to all of them and so much more. So just remember that. Um, beyond that, let's just get right into it. Let's talk about the first tip we're going to share and the artist that we're going to give some examples for. So the first legendary guitarist we're going to talk about is a little bit controversial, but not really. And this legend, of course, is the youngest and his, the name is John Mayer. And whoever you are, you may have heard this and instantly made that face of, oh no, or whatever it may be. But the thing about John Mayer is that he has accomplished so much in his career over you know a couple of decades of doing this. And he really is our generation's best example of somebody who dedicated themselves to one instrument and developed it and became so great at it and can do so many different things with it. He is a modern chameleon where he can be any artist. He can take any sound and be make it his own and impart his own playing style and sound to that. And it's something that we don't value as much as other generations, if that makes sense, just because of the way that we interact with music now. But he really is a legend in his own right. The one tip we want to talk about and that he can take away is tip number one is practice with purpose. And this just breaks down into whenever you're going to practice your instrument, your skill, whatever it is you're doing to get better at, If you don't have a reason to do it, you're not going to get as much from the experience. You're not going to grow as much as you're going to, you're going to keep going in the same circles. If it's just, I'm just going to play, or I'm just going to sing for half an hour or an hour or two hours, whatever it is, you're just going to keep doing the same things because that's what you're comfortable with. That's what you know how to do. You're getting the right results. You're singing the songs, you know, there's no challenge going on there. And if you're not having some kind of purpose to those practices as to I'm going to get better at this, I'm going to engage myself, I'm going to grow these skills, I'm going to learn everything I can about this song or this genre, add it to my personal skill set and grow from there. And John Mayer is the perfect example of this. Um, He, of course, graduated from the Berklee School of Music, which is 
not necessary, but it is one, one of the highest honors that you can have as a musician in the modern age of just, you put the work in, you put your money where your mouth is, you put the dollars down, you put the time in your life to go learn all about music, expose yourself to different things, you know, dive head deep into the theory behind everything. And you can do this at any university. You can do this in so many different ways. You never have to do this to get the same knowledge base, but it does say something about your dedication and being able to, and I guarantee you, if you've, you've earned that degree from anywhere, you put in the time, you put in the effort, you've, you've done the practice time. So it's a very good source to show this person knows what they're talking about when it comes to how to practice, how to get the most out of their time alone when they're ready to put on a performance or write a song or whatever it is in what they do with their music. They have that knowledge base. They have the credentials to back it up. Um, one of my favorite things about John Mayer, as we're talking about practicing with a purpose, is that he has a tendency to be a talker. He is great at, like I said, being a chameleon in whatever environment he's in, either musically or as a, a human being, just adapting to the room he's in. And those people are hard to read sometimes, and you can't really tell if they're being genuine or if they're just BSing you on some level. But with him, the second he gets a guitar in his hand and you can see that he starts running through his routines and sharing what he does to grow as a musician, his head kind of drops and his eyes kind of glaze over to the point where you can see that that tunnel vision, that focus on what he's doing, that, that just the world melts away and he's able to just be in the moment and work on exactly what he needs to with that instrument in his hands. You can see it become an extension of who he is and what he's trying to share. All that being said, he grew up with a lot of us during the internet age into the social media age. And there's a lot of him on social media, on you know TikTok, on Instagram, sharing what he does, showing people what to do, how he does his practice. And that's not, we don't have that with a lot of these legends. A lot of legends are just complete enigmas, mysteries. We have the stories from roadies. We have the stories from bandmates and other musicians, but there's a lot missing. With this exact person, with John Mayer, you get to see what he's doing. You get to see his mindset when he sits down to record the music, why he's doing it, why he's playing what he's playing. And something he consistently say, says as you're practicing with a purpose is to always have a sense of timing with you, always have a sense of playing with other musicians. And even if, even if you're just practicing by yourself, you should be playing to a beat. Even if it's just stomping your foot along to what you're doing, you know, one, two, three, four, and you're just playing and you have that sense of rhythm. Then you know when you step in with another musician, with other musicians in a band or a group, you've already got that all worked out. You have everything set to go. You know what to do because you just have that feel and you just sink right back into that because you've already practiced it. That's the key. And of course, if you can work with a metronome, all the better, just because you know that you're on beat and you have this down, you know, then if you have to work with a click in a studio or if you play with a live band that has a click in your in-ears, all those things you're able to do, you're able to move forward and just know what to do. But you already got the feel for the music because you practice in a groove, you practice set into that rhythm. It's fantastic. It's the best way to go. And I think it's one of the best pieces of advice that he shares. And he does share quite a few nuggets if you want to go follow his stuff. He shares so much great stuff. Um, he also shares this other piece, uh, piece of information when you're learning to you know, practice and you, how to get the most out of practice. He, he really talks a lot about the mental side of practice where you think about what you're doing and then you do it. You know, And then he'll sing something and then play it on the guitar. Or if you could do the same thing with the piano, sit down and sing that scale or sing that piece and then try to copy the same thing and play it. It really starts to build this connection, this bridge between you and that instrument, you and what you're trying to get across. And being able to instantly recall that and use that is such a great, great thing to have. Um, cannot recommend it high enough. It's so smart just to sit down and sing along with what you do, sing it, then do it, or sing along with what you're doing. It really helps with your music theory, understanding intervals, understanding where you're at in a scale or how that chord and what notes you're choosing work well with single note choice, single note note choices. It works fantastic. Um, it's, it's just a great piece of advice. He also shares another thing which I really liked and especially it really does apply with, with him as well is that notes are a lot like words. And he says this, and I'm just paraphrasing, of course, but notes are like words. We all know a lot of words. We know 
all of them, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to just sit down and say all the words and just blurt them out, even though you know them. We, we choose when to say them, which words go where, uh, how to say them, how to use our voice to use an inflection in different parts of the words, all those kind of things. We're very particular about how we use those words. And playing music should be the same. You might know the scales, you might know the chords, but just sitting there and mashing them doesn't do any good. It doesn't convey anything. You aren't connecting with other people unless you're choosing mindfully what you, you need to be doing, choosing the right time to use that right note, how to say it, what kind of dynamics are going to this. You know, that could be your, your sense of inflection, like, a, like you're talking. Very, very good advice. So he's a great reference on that, how to practice with purpose. I love, I'm going to share a quote with each of them that I think reflects what we're trying to say. And the quote that I chose for John was, everything you learn, learn the building blocks for that thing you just learned. And practice is the perfect time to do that. When you're learning a song and you sit down and you play the chords to that song, learn why they're those, what, what chords were picked, what scale was this taken from, how did they build these chords? Why do they work together? Why, why does this chord sound dissonant versus everything else? Why is it building this tension? And how are we relieving this tension? These are just general questions to throw out there and dig deeper into why you're playing what you're playing. And the more that you understand, the more that you can piece that together, the more that you can apply that to your own writing, to your own playing style. And it's just great advice. Great, great person to pull from. Fantastic thought process. And we're just lucky enough to get to learn from them. So... Tip number one. Let's move on to tip number two and legendary guitarist number two. And tip number two is going to be something that we really love to say around here. We love to buy into. We love to, to preach this. And that is to embrace collaboration, to work with those around you and to really enjoy doing it. And the artist that we chose to highlight this, who I think is honestly one of the perfect examples for one of these tips, is none other than the great late bb king and the man was one of the best at working with other musicians finding a way to incorporate them into his live shows or into his recordings and bring out the best in them but also to still be able to stand out and show what he was in that same setting was just absolutely amazing um he had worked with you know hundreds of other musicians on different projects, different shows, different recordings. He just found a way to find the people that were trying to make music and connect with others and be a part of that and to make it something unique. Um, some of the great things that came out of this just for him and himself and something that you can take away from this as you're embracing co co collaboration and what you're going to get out of it is just one, expanding your knowledge getting to see other people work, how they do what they do, how they're connecting with their audience, how they're getting their work out there and getting better and, and doing everything. Picking up on that, expanding your own knowledge is completely one of the most valuable things out there. You'd pay good money to learn that from somebody else. So if you can do it for free and also get something out of it and make that connection, just a double bonus. And then another great one, that I, I know can apply to what you do and as you try to grow is that you can expand your reach by collaborating with other people that are maybe just just on a different side of your genre in a completely different genre. You know, just being able to have them hear what you do and then maybe they'll, you know, get enough in their head, hear enough of that earworm that they're going to seek out your music and see what you do, what you have to offer. Um, he was fantastic. The BB worked with uh, U2. He did a great song with them. And then, you know, he's reaching out to the rock audience, not just the blues. Uh, he worked with Brad Paisley, did a great song. Then he's reaching out to the country artists and getting that side of the music aisle. Um, other examples, he's worked with John Mayer, who we just talked about. Uh, D'Angelo, he did a great R&B song with some guitar in it. And the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, a great one to talk about that he actually won a Grammy for was Riding with the King. It was just him and the, uh, another guitar god that's not on our list today, but uh, Eric Clapton, they did an album together and they won a Grammy for it. And it was just him collaborating with Eric and, and just putting out some blues music in the modern 90s. You know, I think it was pretty sure the 90s, but I could be wrong. If it's not, I probably flashed it on the screen or, or something like that. But, you know, blues wasn't as popular in the 90s and it, especially in the 2000s, it really started to fade. 
and they were able to win a Grammy off that and get the word out there. And they were, I remember they were on MTV with one of their videos, like these two older guys playing blues. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment because they joined forces and collaborated. Uh, th those are the things you really need to take away from that uh, and find in working with others. One of the best things that can come out of it, at, besides all the things we just mentioned, is that you can wind up defining yourself and your sound. You cannot beat that. When you get to define your own sound and figure out what makes you and you're sharing your sound and you know you do it enough times with other people and you can start to pick out like what your essence that you're sharing with everybody and how to build upon that, expand it and emphasize it when it's important. Uh, BB knew it was the king of, of knowing just when to play just enough and how to hit, who's the master of hitting it at top octave above wherever he was playing on the guitar. And it was just so signature him. You knew once you heard those couple, couple of repetitive heats, hits on that note that oh, this is definitely a BB song. And, it, and of course, can't talk about BB without talking about a signature vibrato where he would hit that note and just get that jiggle going. And, and it's just so beautiful, just like a singing voice. But that's what to take away from him. That's it, you know, embrace collaboration. And the last thing, we're just gonna share a quote from him that I thought would apply to this and from BB himself, the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. And that's such a wonderful, perfect quote. Nothing is as valuable as what you're able to learn because nobody can ever take that away from you. Uh, he came out from nothing. He had to teach himself to read. You know, he was all about promoting education and learning for this exact reason. And it's a wonderful quote to remember a, a wonderful man. So. Hi there, and welcome to the ad break. We're just going to take a moment to let everybody know about our community of growing members. And if you'd like to be a part of that, just look at the info below and there will be a click there for an email sign up to join in and get your voice heard. As well as you're enjoying this content, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the numbers 145 world. There you can join any of our groups and you can add to the discussion of what topics we will choose that will help you and hopefully future members of our groups, as well as join monthly Q&As and other such benefits. Again, that's patreon.com slash the numbers 145 rural, and we look forward to seeing you there. Now, back to that regularly scheduled episode and enjoy that content. Thanks again. On to number three. Tip number three is going to be stay true to your vision. And for this one, uh, since it's my show, <laughs> I get to write the script. I picked my own personal legend. And it is for a lot of people that especially hardcore guitar players that come out of any generation. But the, the most recent, um, Stevie Ray Vaughan. And nobody could tell you more about staying on track, staying to who you are as a person than Stevie Ray Vaughan from the very, very early age. He picked up music. He loved his brother, his brother, Jimmy Vaughn, who is a famous musician in his own right. He was able to listen to him and he, he picked up a, a saxophone. And he tried the drums really early in life, six, seven, eight, right in that area. And it wasn't really picking up. And then around that time, his dad bought him a toy guitar from Sears. And for any of our older audience, audience, they're going to instantly understand that ordering things from Sears used to be the big deal. You know, you get that big Sears catalog, you get the Sears store, and ordering it was just how you got the, the fancy things from outside of where you lived. But he got that guitar and he sat down and he just dedicated himself. And from that moment on, it wasn't just, I like music. He was a guitar player. It was everything he was. It was everything he wanted out of life was to be a great guitar player. And he sat down and learned and listened to the greats. And, and my favorite thing about him is that he's, he's all self-taught, like a lot of great musicians. But he sat down and just listened to the records and learned. You know, he put on Albert King and, and just sat there and played T-Bone Walker and, and all, the, all the greats from before him. And sat there and just played along and tried to learn what they were doing and, and picked up what he could for what they were playing and just grew from there. And... It, if you get a chance to read his biography, it's fantastic. It's just called Texas Flood, like his first album and one of his favorite songs that he loved to play. Um, every step in his journey wasn't something about, I'm going to try something different or I'm going to go this way and I'll get back to being guitar or they grew that way. It was just another step forward in his guitar playing and his music. 
but it was always straightforward. And this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to find a way to do it. And even if I can't get to that point, this is just who I am. I'm going to play these these dive bars every night just because it's who I am and what I love. Um, one of his biggest influences and, and one of the things that really shines through in his playing was Jimi Hendrix. And he had a great interview with somebody. And you could tell he had a drug problem when he was, you know, in the early years in his career. And you could tell he was pretty high in the cocaine at this moment. But he had an interview with a lady that had asked him about Jimi Hendrix and his influence on him on his playing. And she asked him, how does your guitar playing vary from Jimi Hendrix? And he took a second and looked down and he gave one of my favorite answers to anything. And he said, well, he's him and I'm me. And what else could you ever say? He, go, he actually elaborates a bit on that. And it really defines on having that vision and sticking with it is that, you know, Jimi Hendrix played everything that sparked his interest and that he felt great about. That's what he played. Well, I play whatever I hear and what I like. And what speaks to me, and then I play that. That's why we're different. That's and, and it just so perfectly resonates. Yes, they're both amazing guitar players, loosely based on the blues for Hendrix, and, and you know comes from a, a strong blues background. And of course, Stevie was very deep into the blues and was the modern reson- renaissance of the blues movement. But just that in itself shows that. We're different enough because we followed what made what moved us, what gave us that spark. They followed that vision and stayed with it. Um, one of there's a couple of things he says that really show you how focused he was just on guitar. And he would always say, playing the guitar is not just a hobby or a job, but it's a way of life. How much more of a straight line? This is exactly what I'm gonna do. This is who I am. Can you get as to? not take people saying that this is a side thing this is a a part-time gig this is a hobby this is just a low-grade skill like no this is who i am and how i define myself how i share who i am and it's just that dedication and staying focused on it doesn't matter what happens or how it happens i'll find my way forward but i know this is who i am that kind of dedication can be great for us all and what we do what we choose to take on especially when it comes to, you know, focusing on your instrument and your main skill. The quote I want to share from Stevie on this one is, and I quote, of course, I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. I'm just trying to be better than I was yesterday. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. It doesn't matter who's the best around you, what they're doing. That's not how he achieved becoming one of the greats of all time. It was just by being better himself the day before. If you can take anything else from that tip, that's it. Just be better than yourself a day before and you will grow and you will get better and you will reach new heights, I promise you. On to tip number four. Tip number four is going to be be persistent. And this one's a very, very important one. Like I said, all these could apply to anybody we're talking about, but anybody that you see that has achieved any sort of success, uh, success in music or anything in life. It never starts out with you the best. You know, you never hit the lottery and you're just going at it. It's always a version of I had to work through things. And this one we're talking about Mark uh, Knopfler uh, from of Dire Straits fame rose to huge prominence in the you know, late 70s and the 80s uh, with such hits as uh or his, his top album, Brother in Arms, is one of the best albums of all time. Fantastic. Sultans of Swing is a song everybody knows. Um, all, so many great hits, so many great songs, such a unique playing style that is, of course, become legendary in itself. Um, but he had an early start in, you know, when he was growing up where he would just be working. He worked for a paper for a while. And then he went to college and got a degree in journalism and then, of course, got a job as a journalist. And he just kind of played the music a bit and did a bit of songwriting. But he was always going to be focused on, you know, doing that with his life and and taking that on life, being a journalist. But as he kept going, he was writing songs. He started being like four to five different bands, doing all these things and, and just growing as an artist, putting this music together 
never quite giving up. Whatever he was taking on in life, whatever was going on, he was still trying to find a way to be a part of music and not give up on this dream. And then, of course, once he found the, the right group, the right formation of people, and they had that, that first demo and that first hits that just shot up and everybody knew who they were, never looked back. And, and he was just persistent from that day forward. And it doesn't even just apply to that. Of course, they had the most success you can have as a musician with Dire Straits. And in 1995, they disbanded. They broke up the group. They could have. There's most of them. I think all of them are still living today, and they're able. They could just have a reunion tour, live off the, the hits, keep playing all those. But, and they've asked him many times, "Do you want to do this? Do you want the money? Do you want to do these shows together?" No, he has put eight albums out since then, 1995, as a solo artist, working with various artists. He took on writing scores for movies, all those kind of things. Just being persistent in music and sharing his vision of what music is his part of his soul he wanted to convey with others and share with others he just stayed at it and kept doing that he just you can't say more more than that like you just do what you do because you love it i could get paid more to do this but i've already experienced that that's part of my past i'm going to keep doing this and growing as an artist growing as a musician and keep getting better at this And, and it's just so great to see and it's something you should be able to take away from that just amazing the quote i want to share for him is that success is only meaningful if it's based on your own terms and what you're truly passionate about and when it comes to being persistent what better quote could you have it doesn't matter what other standards people have set for you or what you're seeing as held up as this is what it means to be successful. If it doesn't mean to you what you've sat down and defined, I'm successful if I'm able to share my, my, my music with other people. I'm successful if I'm able to go out and play a show for 50 other people. Those kind of things, as you're reassessing what success is to you and where you want to be, you know, the end of the year, three years from now, five years from now, those are the things that matter. What you've defined as your success, as long as you're persistent, you're going to hit those and as long as you know that this is what you want to do and you're honest with yourself, you're going to make it. So just being persistent and being believing in what you're doing can really get you places that you never thought you could get before. So on to the very last tip, number five. And this one is continuously learn and adapt. And if you can do this, you can do anything. You can last. You can have that career that lasts decades or your whole life. And who other to choose for this, this one here than Dave Grohl? That man is the definition of pivot, of change, of I can do this. Let me just rearrange how I do things and we'll succeed. Just from his backstory of growing up in you know the, the Virginia area, the D.C. area, loved punk music, joined punk bands as a, as a hardcore, amazing drummer, just pure power in drumming form gets picked up by Nirvana goes all the way to the West coast joins them not knowing what's going to happen in the future. And they blow up not just big time into the generation X version of the Beatles. They are the band. They are the, everybody's going out and uh, all the huge corporations, all the big management people are trying to sign anybody that sounds remotely like, Nirvana or from Seattle or anything like that that they can get their hands on because they wanted a, a bit of that cash and money. And he's part of this whole huge thing. He's one of the biggest drummers in the world. He, they're having these hits and Nirvana songs are catchy and they're fantastic in their way. Don't ever underestimate how great Kurt Cobain was. But how many other songs can you point to and you can sing along with the drum track? And that's the effect that he had on the drums. Absolutely amazing. You can instantly hear what he was adding to the song. And it, if you took it out, it's not the same song anymore. It's not as good. That's amazing to say about a drummer. Kurt winds up killing himself, you know, and they're, they're friends at the time. They're roommates. They're in a band, you know, they're taking on the world and he winds up, you know, taking his own life. And he could have easily disappeared from the world and shown up, you know, 20 years later at playing a couple songs or maybe they'll be inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, whatever it may be. But he could have easily just faded into the background and become nothing. 
but he pivoted and he changed moving forward. He had his time to console himself and to deal with the grief and the loss as, as much as one can. And he was doing his own recording at the time and they're available. You can go listen to them. They're fantastic. Uh, Pocket Watch is one of the recordings he was doing at the time. Super great. Um, Marigold is one of the songs that there was a B-side on a Nirvana album. And it was his own writing, his own vocals, his guitar work. So he was doing this work, but then he is out playing music. He's trying to get back on his feet. And wouldn't you know it, Saturday Night Live comes along. Tom Petty, the amazing top of the world Tom Petty comes to him and says, our drummer's out right now. Can you step in and be our drummer for us? He plays the show for them. He's in the background. You can see him flailing his arms around and just killing it. And afterwards, Tom Petty calls him and says, do you want to be our drummer full time? And instead of what could have been the easy way to go, he could have been another drummer for another legendary artist, another band. And he says, I have my own journey. I have my own thing. I'm going to follow this through and, and, and do that. And he forms the Foo Fighters and they, they become the biggest band in the world. And the only consecutive you know, pop rock band over the last 25 years, 30 years. That's absolutely amazing. Talk about adaptability. And he's and he's done it so many different times. He's, you know, he's gone through loss. They've gone through band members that have come and gone and they've moved on to their own different things. Or they, I believe their first drummer for the Foo Fighters, he wound up recording the drums for the second album. And he was not happy about that. So he left the band and then they, they replaced him with, of course, Taylor, uh, Taylor Hawkins. But... Again, just finding different pieces of parts until everything became this cohesive unit, till it became the Foo Fighters. And it was just from being adaptable and being able to figure out what works and what didn't work. Uh, even then, when losing Taylor to his death, you know, that hit hard. That I, did, I myself personally, being a, a lifelong Foo Fighters fan and watching this from the very beginning, I almost personally just wish he would hang up the hang up the shoes and call it a day but didn't pivoted adapted got a new drummer you know they were best best friends brother they, brothers from another mothers they always called each other but he just kept moving forward adapted as best he could and kept things going and you just cannot say enough about that on top of just being a top-notch musician and working with you know, numerous other people adapting to their play styles. You played with Queens of the Stone Age on their Songs for the Deaf album. Um, did a bunch of recordings when he was making a documentary about the legendary recording studio in L.A. And he just worked with Paul McCartney. He worked with Stevie Nicks. He worked with all of them, adapted his style and his song, his playmaking. He played guitar. He played drums. He played whatever he needed to to be part of it and to help them and make these songs and just be adaptable. And it was just fantastic to watch. Um, but on top of just being the musician, he was directing that. So he's now a director. He had Sonic Highways for HBO, which was in a fantastic series. If you want to learn about being a musician and, and going on the road, and it just took the the essence of whatever city they were in and made that into a song. And it was just so fantastic and great film work. And he's an amazing father. Of course, that's the most important thing. If you're going to be anything, be a great father, be a great person, dependable to your family. That's the most important thing ever. So I just have to say he's one of the most adaptable humans and he always finds a way to, to be amazing and be good at what he's doing. Oh yeah. Top, Top selling book, uh, his autobiography, Storyteller, is just, he's a writer too, why not? He just can do whatever he needs to do to get the job done, and it's absolutely amazing. Always challenging himself. Uh, the quote that I chose to end this all off from Dave was, you aren't defined by your past, you are prepared by it. Absolutely the perfect quote when we're talking about being adaptable and continuously learning Thank you, Dave Girl, for all you've done. We really, 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 really appreciate it. So there's five great tips that you can learn from, use, uh, and take from these legendary guitarists to propel yourself forward, find that motivation, and get better and grow your playing 
and you're practicing and all of that and just get better and better. So if that helped you at all, if you found anything useful, any nuggets in there, please give us a subscribe, give us a like. Those things seem so small and so so useless, but they really mean a lot. They really propel us forward. We really want to thank everybody who's been doing it. You guys are the best. Here's to you. And from there, we'll just have another one for you next week. We're always here. Check out whatever we've done. There's so much in our channel that can help you move forward. Check all that stuff out. And we'll see you guys on that next one. Bye.